Scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. It can be found on page 1028 in the Black Bibles if you want to turn there. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Word of the Lord. Our sermon this morning is entitled Faithful Suffering. I promise I already had that name for the sermon picked out before the Aggie game, so just want y'all to know that. Sorry, Aggies. Anyway. We are going to consider what it means to faithfully suffer, and as we do that, let's, uh, let's come to the Lord and ask him that he would help us. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that your word is so honest about the human experience, that it's so honest about our plight and our need for a savior, and we thank you that your word became flesh and that your son Jesus stepped into our pain and our suffering to give us hope. Help us to see that now. And we pray and ask all this in his name, amen. So three things I wanna look at with you all this morning. Um, The first point will be much longer than the second two, but the reality of Christian suffering, it's the first point, the reality of Christian suffering. Secondly, the temporality of Christian suffering. It's temporal. It's temporary. And then third, so what? The reality, the temporality, and so what? Uh, when I, I guess this was like maybe a year and a half ago, every once in a while our pastors and pastoral interns will, will do something together just for, for fun, for fellowship, for encouragement. And I had this idea that I, I wanted to do with them. There's this place down Katy Freeway near Stratford High School called Zero Latency. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's a virtual reality arcade. And uh, basically you go into a room that's about the size of this sanctuary, maybe a little smaller, and they give you a headset, virtual reality headset, earphones, and a, a weighted gun so that you can fight zombies together. And I was like, well, you know, we're fighting evil as pastors, let's just go and try this out. And so we go and we did, and just in case you're wondering how do your pastors and pastoral interns handle terror like that, the bigger they were, the louder they screamed. I'll just leave it at that, <laughs> All right? And I understand that I'm one of the largest pastors here, and also if there's ever a zombie apocalypse, we need to pray for Ryan Dugan. I'll just, okay? <laughs> so, but we, we do this whole thing and we're playing, we're having fun, and it's, but it's also, it's terrifying. And at the, at the end of that 30 minutes, <laughs> we, we took off the headsets, we took off the headphones, and we were awakened to this, oh, that wasn't, that was all in some other world. And there's this other reality that we were standing right in the middle of, and seeing this reality makes us way less afraid of the one that we were just in. And in a very real sense, that's what, is being given as a vision to the Christians who are living in Smyrna. Because they are living in a terrifying reality. And God in his kindness sends this apocalyptic vision to the apostle John, who's on an island in Greece called Patmos. And he tells him to send this vision to these seven churches that are in Asia. And one of those churches is in a place called Smyrna, which is modern day um, Izmir, which is the third largest city. It's still there today. It's the third largest city in Turkey, about four and a half million people. It's a port city on the Aegean Sea. 
And he tells John to send this apocalyptic vision, this message to the church in Smyrna. And I know I've said this a couple of times as we've gone through Revelation. I'm going to keep coming back to this. Revelation comes, the title for the book, Revelation, comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. That's literally what the title of the book is in Greek, apocalypsis. We, we translate that revelation. And in, in, in Greek, the word apocalypsis means to unveil or to reveal or in a sense to take off the goggles and to see what's what's actually happening in this world. In other words, there's more than meets the eye of just our physical world and experience that we live in. And Revelation, it's a biblical prophecy that does what so many biblical prophecies do in the Old and New Testament, which is to primarily tell you about what's currently happening. We think of biblical prophecy as foretelling the future. And that That is part of biblical prophecy, and we'll see that here as we study the book of Revelation together. But it's primarily, most often, that biblical prophecy is used not to foretell the future, but to foretell the present. This is what, this is how things really are right now. And the people in Smyrna need to hear what's actually happening in their world. Because they are living in a place and in a time where it feels terrifying. They're living with the reality of Christian suffering. As I said, they're living in this place called Smyrna, modern day Izmir. Smyrna was particularly loyal as a city to Rome. In fact, Smyrna was the place that the first foreign temple was built to Roman cultic worship. And because of this dynamic a new religion like Christianity was particularly unwelcome in a place like Smyrna. And as a result, these people are are deeply, deeply suffering. It's interesting, when when we look at these other seven cities that receive messages from Jesus, almost all of them get rebuked for something. We saw that when we studied Ephesus two weeks ago. Jesus says, you've, you've forgotten your first love. He rebukes them. You might, you might have noticed Smyrna doesn't get rebuked. They're one of the only cities. There's no rebuke. Jesus has nothing, no like big scandalous sin like the, the church we're gonna talk about next week has going on. In, in many ways, they're, they're just living faithfully and yet they're really suffering. And I think that's something that we need to notice. Because oftentimes when we, when we experience suffering, we may be tempted to think, oh, this is because I've done something wrong. In fact, in, uh, earlier in the book of John, we see that the disciples, they observe a man who's been born blind and they ask Jesus about it. They say, all right, who did something wrong here? Was it the man sin or was it his parents who sinned? And Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's why he's blind. That the works of God might be displayed in him. We need to be really careful not to draw a direct line from um, our suffering to some sin that we must have done. And Christian, what that means is you and I should, should expect suffering. Becoming a Christian doesn't suddenly mean that now your life is going to be healthy and wealthy and easy. And this church is experiencing that kind of suffering and they're experiencing it in two particular ways that Jesus names in verse nine. They're poor, they're experiencing poverty. Poverty like many of us have never experienced or can imagine. They're experiencing poverty and they're being slandered and it's very likely that both of these things are happening to them because of their faith. They're losing job opportunities because of their faith. They're being slandered because of their faith. And I can't help but thinking, or as I studied this this week, what would happen if our culture moved in that direction? How would we respond? How would we respond as believers if it became more and more painful to our pockets to follow Jesus? How would we respond if it became 
more and more dangerous for our reputations or even our bodies to follow Jesus. I mentioned this story a few years ago, um, but a pastor friend of mine was leading a Sunday school class talking about Christian suffering in church history. And he, he asked that Sunday school class essentially this question, what, what would we do if our culture moved more in this kind of direction? And my friend imagined that that class would begin discussing things like, well, I guess we would have to start meeting in secret or we have to figure out ways to support one another financially or we, have to, we just have to train our kids what it's gonna look like to remain faithful amidst persecution. But instead, instead this class began discussing how to make sure that would never happen, politically speaking. What are the things that we need to do to make sure that this never happens? Now, should we be politically active? Of course. But my question I would pose to you is where in the Bible do we see that this is how a Christian is fundamentally to answer persecution? And here's the kicker, friends. Some of y'all know this, but this Sunday school class that I'm referring to was not in some faraway state or some faraway country. The Sunday school class that I'm talking about was here at Christ the King. We're the ones who began discussing that. How could we make sure that this would never happen? And look, I get it. It doesn't sound fun to me either. And I think about my own kids and I think about the world that we're in and where things are going and it, it can feel really, really scary. But I want you to note Jesus' posture when it comes to persecution. He tells them that suffering is coming and he doesn't say, now get out of there. Like some, he, he's, he basically tells them that some of them are going to die. He's encouraging them, you have to be, be faithful unto death. Can you imagine someone telling you, hey, someone's gonna come, they're gonna kill you, stay there. Jesus is saying, stay there. Don't, he, he doesn't say, get out of Smyrna. He also doesn't say, pick up your arms and fight those people. Instead, he implores them to be faithful in their suffering. And he assures them with this, he assures them that they will have his presence and his promises and his empathy. Do you see what Jesus says in verse nine? I know your tribulation and your poverty. Jesus wants them to know that he really knows. The Christian God knows suffering in a way that no other God does. The other gods of the other world religions can claim to intellectually know what suffering is like. They can say that they have an intellectual knowledge of it and there could be some comfort in that, but Jesus's knowledge is far more comforting because Jesus, his knowledge goes beyond an intellectual knowledge to an experiential level of knowledge. He knows what it is to suffer. The prophet Isaiah says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Look, this is the kind of person that you want to speak into your suffering. If, for instance, you are, you are currently or have at some point suffered with the trial of infertility, it can be comforting to talk to somebody who has an intellectual knowledge that infertility exists. But to go and sit with a mother of five who knows that infertility exists and to have her speak in to your infertility is likely not as comforting as going to talk to another woman who is either currently or at some point has experienced it herself. We know this to be true. That the one that we want speaking into our pain and suffering is the one who's been through something like we have been through. And Jesus is saying, I know it. And we can go back and look at his story in the Bible and see how he knows poverty like theirs. Even when he was born, Jesus' parents couldn't there was no room for them in the end. You know what? I bet if Joseph had had some money, they would have made some room for him. 
Jesus' parents were so poor, they couldn't afford a room, and he was born and laid in a feeding trough, which the closest thing for us today would be like laying your child in a dog bowl. That's the place that they could afford to put baby Jesus. And just eight days later, when they went to the priest to have sacrifices done, which is according to Leviticus 12, when a woman would have a child, she would go to the priest and offer a sacrifice. And in Leviticus 12, it says, take a lamb and either a pigeon or a turtle dove for the priest to make sacrifice for the woman after she's given birth. But also in Leviticus 12, God, in his wisdom and kindness, makes a stipulation and says, he says this, if she cannot afford a lamb, this is Leviticus 12, if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two doves or two pigeons and when Jesus goes with his mom and dad and they take him in Luke 2 24 Mary and Joseph following the Old Testament law they go to Jerusalem and they can't afford a lamb that's how poor Jesus's family was they couldn't afford a lamb when Jesus was crucified the only thing that he had in his possession was his tunic that the soldiers gambled over Jesus knows poverty like the poverty of the people in Smyrna and he also knows what it's like to be slandered when you go through the gospel accounts of Jesus and look at all that is said and done to him in Matthew Mark Luke and John you'll see the many many times that Jesus is slandered people call him demon-possessed People use racially charged words to denigrate him. His own brothers rebuke him and tell him that he's, quote, out of his mind. His own friends curse him and deny him and leave him. He's publicly slandered and then mocked by his executioners. Jesus knows slander like the kind of slander that the people in Smyrna are enduring. And then he tells them, after he explains, I, listen, I know what this is like. I know your suffering. I know that poverty that you're experiencing. I know what it's like to be slandered. And then he tells them, it's going to go from bad to worse. This is the reality of Christian suffering. He tells them that they will be thrown into prison that there's actually demonic, satanic activity that's happening in their midst that is going to get them thrown into prison. They'll be thrown into prison. And Roman prison internment was often, it was usually historically very short. The reason that you would go to prison during the first century was just to await a trial. And what does Jesus imply is going to happen at the end of this trial? He tells them, be faithful unto death. You're gonna be thrown in prison. There's gonna be some kind of slander brought brought before the judge and you're going to have to remain faithful unto death. This is the reality of the suffering that the people in Smyrna are facing. But he doesn't tell them to avoid it. Rather than giving them ways to avoid their suffering, Jesus gives them truth to sustain them Because their suffering is only going to be for a while and then it will end. Their suffering, he tells them, is going to end. It has an expiration date on it. He tells them there's going to be 10 days of tribulation, but what does that mean? There's an 11th day coming. There is an expiration date for any Christian who suffers. It's my second point, the temporality or the temporariness, temporality of Christian suffering. One of the things that I hope you'll have an eye out for as we we study these seven churches in Revelation, every time that Jesus uh, refers to himself when he begins addressing them, he references the description that's made of the ascended Jesus, this glorious picture of who Jesus is in Revelation 1. We looked at that a few weeks ago. So every time Jesus begins addressing one of these seven churches, he references some truth that's said about him in his glorified form 
that's described in Revelation 1, but it's always a different truth to each of the seven churches. In other words, each of these seven churches that are all struggling in different ways, they each need to see the truth about who Jesus is. They need the goggles lifted. They need the apocalyptic truth of who Christ is revealed to them. And they each need to know different things about the truth of Jesus. And did you see how Jesus describes himself in verse eight? He says this, which is referencing back to Revelation one of how he's described. He says, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Do you see what he's drawing their attention to see? That in the midst of their suffering, grinding poverty, and lies being said about them. Jesus draws their attention to the reality that he is the first and the last who died. That's crazy. The first and the last, God himself died and came to life. Jesus is telling them, look, I've already won. He has endured the suffering of the cross. He died upon it and he's risen. And now he clearly sees the other side. The other side of the veil that is being pulled back for them to also see that Jesus has won. And it's an inevitability that one day all the suffering will end. It is inevitable. All right, I know I've already said one video game reference. I'm gonna do two. I usually don't do a lot of them. I'm doing two in this sermon. Because it's a big kid day, okay? We've got baptisms, first communions, kids. When you are racing in Mario Kart, this is a, for our boomer friends and older, like this is a, a video game. Maybe you've seen people playing it before. Mario Kart, you're racing, you're driving. And when you're losing, Mario Kart really, I think, I don't know if the, the developers of Mario believe in the gospel, like the last shall be first. But that when you're losing, they're really trying to help you come back. And there is an item that the losers in Mario Kart, like me, often get. The blue shell. And kids, you know that when you get a blue shell and you fire the blue shell, it goes racing down the racetrack. And is it going for the person who's in third place or second place? No. It's going to the one who looks like they're winning. And it is an absolute inevitability that that person is about to get annihilated and you don't want to be even close to them when it happens. Do you? Jesus is saying, I fired the blue shell. It's an inevitability. When Jesus' body was buried, when he died, and he was in the tomb for three days, it's like an atomic bomb was detonated in the heart of hell. The serpent that Jesus has been battling since who knows when? <laughs> that serpent, that serpent that God says in Genesis 3 will be wounded by the one whom he bruises, mortally wounded, that serpent has been crushed by Jesus. He is mortally wounded. But you better believe that as he bleeds out, that serpent is going to fight like hell because that's exactly where he's from. And everything that hell has will be thrown against God's people. And that will be a test that will test us. And I don't, I don't say that flippantly because I know some of the tests that y'all are going through. I say that with a heavy heart. I want you to know that Jesus knows. Jesus knows your suffering. Not on just an intellectual level, but in a way in which he has really experienced suffering like yours. 
And he has also made a way so that that suffering one day will fully and finally expire. It will be finished. Johnny Erickson Tata, who has lived most of her life as a quadriplegic woman, puts it this way in, in, in regards to how God tests us. She says, God permits what he hates in order to accomplish what he loves, which is Christ in me who gets the glory. Jesus says, look, Satan is up to things. He's gonna throw you in prison, church in Smyrna. He is throwing everything he's got at you. Don't be afraid of him. He's lost. He's been defeated. Do not fear him. Because God is going to accomplish his purposes. And he will win. I read about a story of a man named Najati and his wife, Shimsa, who actually grew up in this town, Smyrna, but they grew up in the 20th century in Smyrna, modern day Izmir. And Najati grew up as a devout Muslim. But one day he was sitting on a bus and he saw a woman reading a book and he asked her about it and it was the woman who would later become his wife, Shimsa, and she was reading the New Testament. And she told him about Jesus. And over months of friendship and time spent together and talking, Najati believed the gospel. So much so that uh, he and his wife, after they were married, uh, moved to a nearby town so that they could be missionaries and he could be a pastor so that they could share the good news of Jesus. And God was working through them. So much so that people noticed. And in 2008, men stormed into his office and they tortured and executed Najati for being a Christian. Since then, Shimsa has um, given her testimony, some of which I wanna share with you now. And she says this, after my husband died, we have victory. We have victory and we have a lot of pain, especially when I and my two young children feel alone. Because after people went home, we felt really badly alone. But we have a partnership in Gethsemane with Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm so happy for Jesus to take me with him to the Gethsemane Garden where he suffered. She says, and if you wanna glorify Jesus, I want to encourage you, this story is not a drama. This story is not about death. This story, our story is about victory, about gain, about encouragement. I know God showed his love to Turkey, not only on the cross, but by Najati's blood too. And how can I say, Why, God, why do you give me this suffering or this cross? Rather, I'm asking God to help me hold his cross and to lead people to help me to hold his cross with me. How can she say we have victory? How can she say I have victory and a lot of pain in the same breath? Because any person who looks to Jesus In faith, that is someone who has overcome through his victory. Jesus tells us this in John 16. In John 16, he says, I have said these things to you, to his disciples, just before he's about to go to Gethsemane later that day and cry out in agony to his father. He says, I have said these things to you that In me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Tribulation like the kind of tribulation that's described here twice 
in Revelation 2, 8 through 11. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He's overcome the world. And because of that, the suffering that you are experiencing, Christian, it will end. It's like Aslan describes at the end of the last battle, the very end of the Chronicles of Narnia. He tells the children, the dream has ended and this is the morning. One day the dream of all of our pain and all of our sorrow that we have endured will be in the past. It will be like a past dream and there will be a new morning of glory dawned for God's people. For your loved one whose body is ravaged with Parkinson's or MS or ALS or stroke or cancer, one day that dream will be ended and the morning of new life will dawn. They will be crowned with glory, like Jesus says. For those who are suffering from mental health and struggling even just to get out of bed in the morning, one day that dream will be ended and all of the joy of Christ's salvation, every bit of it, will be fully experienced and enjoyed on that morning of eternity. For the child whose body has been poked and prodded by medical professionals who are trying to help them physically grow or trying to help them get rid of the cancerous cells in their body or trying to determine a diagnosis for their chronic pain, for that child, the dream one day will be ended and a new morning with a new, painless, glorious body will arise. For the elderly man or woman who's losing their faculties and even their memories, whose life seems to be dripping, drifting into some sort of endless vapor, for that man, one day the dream will be ended and there will be a new morning with a new mind and a new body. For the desperately lonely looking for a deeper connection, one day the dream will be ended and the morning of the new eternity will awaken. And you will awaken to the face of the one that your heart has most deeply desired. Friends, what we need to do is listen to the victor. He's telling us not to fear. So what do we do? We listen to him. If we have the light of Jesus inside of us, it most often shines clearly when our bodies are pierced and cracked and broken wide open so that his light can show forth. This is how we participate in his sufferings. And friends, we need each other in that. I hope you noticed that every letter like this in Revelation to these churches, they're written to churches, not to individual people. They're written to churches because we need each other. And God in his grace has given us one another to walk alongside each other in our pain and in our suffering and to remind one another to look to Jesus. To look to him in faith where there is eternal hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank thank you for the hope that we have in him that by his blood, that by his wounds we are healed that we are forgiven, that we are restored to right relationship with you. I pray that you would help us to look in faith to him. And we ask all this in his name. Amen.